Hello and welcome to the School of Serenity. We are excited to be here with you today. We are being broadcast on 4MTV and 4MTV is an initiative from North America focused on mental health. The 4M stand for mental health, migration, multi-language and culture, and mindfulness. And we are committed to practicing mindfulness beyond borders. I am your host, Kara Keem. I am the intuitive therapist, and I'm so passionate about intuition that I have written a book about it called Discovering My Wings, which really discusses how my life radically transformed when I tapped into this inner voice and inner knowing. And we are very excited for our guest here today, Courtney Fincher. We're going to welcome her. She is a somatic attachment practitioner. Leading up to her current practice, she completed a three-year training focusing on releasing stress and trauma from the body. She is also trained as a dynamic attachment repatterning in that modality, and that addresses early attachment and relational injuries. Her work helps to restore a sense of safety and belonging. What important work. Wow. Thank you for being here today, Courtney. We're so excited to have you. It's really an honor to be here. The fun yes. conversation to have. Yes, absolutely. So let's just start simply for our audience so that they can learn about this work that you do. Can you explain what somatic experiencing is and somatic attachment so that they might have an understanding of why this work is so important? Sure. I'd love to. And of course, we could talk the whole hour about that because it's really big, but I will try to be brief. Um, Somatic experiencing is a body-based healing modality that helps to um, mitigate the impacts of stress and trauma. Mm -hmm. It was developed by Dr. Peter Levine. It's been used clinically for over 40 years. Yeah. He was, he got his doctorate. He has many degrees, but he got his doctorate in, um, gosh, what's it called? Like biomedical, um, medical biophysics, I think. Mm -hmm. At any rate, he had studied the behavior of animals and was really noticing that animals in the wild didn't hold trauma in their bodies. And wow. through that was realizing that because the theory is we have this cortex, the neocortex, our rational brain will get in the way of the evolutionary biology of our nervous system mm -hmm. discharging because it doesn't always match the social situation or we might think of ourselves differently. Right. And so in that he started studying the nervous system and how might we work with our physiology to come out of the freeze and mobilize or to actually process that impeded fight or flight response. Right, right. Yes. I love Peter Levine. I absolutely love him. He's, he's, yes, his work is incredible. And so in his work, tell us about how we can come out of that response, because t tell us about the work that you're doing, because I know that, I mean, we both know that trauma really does get stuck and stored in the body. That's right. Yeah. So, right. So a lot of different, um, therapies, actually including somatic experiencing, we'll use talk as a component of it. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my clients, like, we don't want to just cut the head off and like, do away with the mind, right? But we need to integrate it in and pay attention to the rest of the body as well. So many types of therapies use talk and in the telling of the story, again, for some people, maybe that traumatic event doesn't get resolved in the telling. And for others, it could maybe even feel re-traumatizing to bring up that material. Yes. And what somatic experiencing does is it's not in the content of the story. It's in the observation of the activation of the nervous system that's mm -hmm. happening in the telling. Mm -hmm. And so paying attention to that Mm -hmm. And tracking the felt sense, which is those internal sensations that are going along, bringing our awareness to that. Typically, with traumatic experiences, there wasn't enough time to reorient. Things were happening too fast. Something was overwhelming. 
Right. So slowing that down and realizing, oh yeah, I really needed, I can feel shaking and trembling that needed to happen. Or, you know, I needed to feel the musculature of my body and feel mm -hmm. it's pressing away. You know, there's all different ways that that can present, but in tracking the nervous system through the felt sense, there's a chance for the body to actually have the time to do the discharge process that would be, that would have happened in the, in the natural wild as the living had observed in other animals. Yes. Yes. And it's amazing how shaking and getting in the body and moving things after a traumatic experience can really, really just release the tension in the nervous system. Oh my gosh. Yes. There's a, um, a psychologist, Eugene Gelt. Oh, actually, that's what's interesting. I don't think he was a psychologist in the 1960s. He was maybe a social scientist, but he did this big study on like, well, what about healing works, you know? And yeah. he's the one who termed the coin felt sense. Mm -hmm. And he looked at all these different modalities and it was like across the board, it was when someone could tap into their experience in the present moment mm -hmm. that the biggest change could happen because that's when they were able to actually in real time change the physiology. Right, and that's right. That's when happens, yeah. Yes, and learn that in that present moment, they are actually safe. It's such a huge part of it. That's oftentimes the missing piece is that things will happen so fast that they don't realize the event is over. Right. Or things were so unsafe in life that they're maybe in early life, there isn't, a landing in the body of like, oh, wait, this is a safe moment. Yes. Yes. Right. And so how to feel safe in our bodies. Right. Yes. And to know the event is over. We are here. We are in this moment. I mean, the brain has such a amazing capacity to replay old stories and old traumas over and over again so that the body is actually feeling as though we are in that present moment all the time. Absolutely. When we're stuck in that acute trauma phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And I love what you said about in talk therapy, it can cause the emotional distress just talking about it because that's really reinforcing that trauma circuit and the brain. And yeah. so, yeah. And it's a really, it's talk therapy can do wonders for some people because we need to be heard. We need to be seen. It's making sense of things has its role. So I'm certainly not negating that. It's just that it's really sad that for so many people that has turned them away from their own um, getting support with their own mental health. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I found that to be true too. And so I think the wave of the future in therapy really is more somatic work, getting in the body, blending energy work and other modalities. And a lot of my interviews have been about these different modalities because I think we are really finally starting to understand that we have to heal in the mind and the body. Yes, absolutely. You can really, I, I, I might be biased in the world that I'm in, right. but I really just see that becoming so much more embraced and more common knowledge and moving in that direction. Yeah, I do too. I really do too. Yes. So tell us about your practice and who you're working with. You're based in Asheville. I'm based in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, but I do have clients across the state border. So I, because I work on Zoom and so that's really beautiful. I've been able to work with a more diverse population because of that. My background was um, in early education and early child development, and I thought that my practice would be with children because my original entry into this was through um, interpersonal neurobiology and the work of Dan Siegel, and then I moved to attachment, and I became um, a circle of security facilitator, so I started running groups for parents teaching them how to create secure attachment. And I then started working to, you know, do more trainings for educators and parents around what are these relational skills that create safety? Mm -hmm. And all the while I was 
studying somatic experience and really working with the nervous system. And when I left education and started doing this work, I really thought I would be working with children, but have found that that while I have a few children clients, mostly it's the adults. And I'm noticing that my practice attracts a lot of people who maybe they do have, first off the word trauma, we use it all the time. Um, so I would just venture to say that everybody has trauma. Absolutely. I was going to say that we've <laughs> all got it in some way, in some form. It could be little T or big T, but my understanding of trauma from the research I've done, it's whenever resiliency has been suspended and who hasn't had a moment of that in life. Exactly. Yeah. One of the short definitions is anything that was too overwhelming. Yes. 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 The, right. Too fast, too overwhelming, too long. We all have that. So, right. So people come, whether they're dealing with anxiety or maybe there was like a traumatic event, we sometimes call that shock trauma, or maybe there's just something that hasn't felt resolved in their lives. And I'm tending to work with people that also are identifying or wanting to work with early attachment wounding. Mm -hmm. I have also done the Diane Paul Heller's work, which is the dynamic attachment repatterning work. Yep. I was going to ask about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so that work, it's like somatic experiencing is working with the nervous system, but it's kind of working with our instincts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where the attachment work is also on the nervous system level, but it's more um, about relationality. Mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. So both of them have these, this nervous system response of, when am I safe and when am I in threat? And how is my nervous system working with that? Yes. Our early attachment system is forming, you know, in utero to zero to seven. And it we're plastic and we're learning we can change and we can, you know, heal our attachment system to become more secure, which is the sort of standard of health. We want secure attachment. But in those early years, we might, I would say, cope or adapt by forming one of the more insecure attachment styles. Mm -hmm. And these things are not necessarily based on memories that we have, right? So mm -hmm. then when implicit memories arise, working with, oh, why was that threatening? Mm -hmm. Why Why do you think you didn't feel safe? And it's not really a why, it's more of, oh, that's interesting. And yeah. noticing how your body is responding and then being able to apply that to understanding our adult relationships and being able to move towards if that's one of the things that's difficult or to be able to contain our energy and learn about boundaries if that's the thing that's difficult. And, you know, it's a big topic I could keep going. But. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I once had a therapist tell me, you know, it's a great blessing that we don't remember anything before the age of five. And <laughs> rarely we do. I mean, I don't remember much, you know. However, this was, you know, a decade ago, I think before we really understood, maybe we don't have the memory, but our body certainly is remembering everything that happened in those early years. And that's sort of been that missing link, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, I don't remember that trauma. I, you know, it must not have affected. Oh, no, no, no. Your body is very tuned into that as your nervous system. Absolutely. Our nervous system is forming during those years. And so it's, really impactful actually because we're learning how to be in the world and we're learning our socialization skills too mm -hmm. so we're learning that from our culture our family our communities yes yeah. us yeah. yes and so you can do all of this work remote online through zoom yes and that actually has been a little shocking to me because it is so body-based Yes. That I didn't think it would translate, but during COVID and the pandemic, we just had to be really resilient and flexible and adjust. And it's actually been profound to see that it does translate. Yeah. I know. And I've found the same because I've gone completely remote in my practice and I combine Reiki with psychotherapy. And it's yeah. been amazing to me that energy work can translate remotely. I mean, I wouldn't have believed it, I don't think, until I went all remote. And my clients have stayed with me. They found it just as effective and some even prefer it. 
I've had the same experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it really, you know, people can be in their own environment. They can really, you know, the, the rushing from to and fro sometimes you're yeah. like, just, you know, have this session and yeah. yes. Yes. Yeah. It's just, it's nice to be comfortable and you can even just throw on a sweater and PJs on the bottom and clients are like, it just feels so nice to be home and cozy and not have to be rushing around. So yeah. I love that this work for both of us is translating because like you said, you can work across borders and reach a wider population that way. Oh, it's been really incredible. Yeah. And um, there was something else you said. I think I wanted to speak to one of the ways that both of these modalities work, as I said before, is through the nervous system. And mm -hmm. Um, a lot of that, the clinical application of that comes through um, sort of this polyvagal theory, which is something that obviously our nervous systems have had this mechanism for a long time, but this is sort of like new science in the last 20 or so years. Yes. And you, Yeah, you've definitely heard of it. And it's really um, acknowledging this bottom-up processing Mm -hmm. now, um, it's it's the social engagement piece is part of our evolutionary biology of what it is to be human and have this prefrontal cortex and be a social creature and all of the cues that we get around safety and neuroception and resonance and presence and you know we can talk about all those things but I just didn't know that we would be able to feel those things through a computer and we're just such adaptable creatures and we can we can. Yes. Yes. And I think that's what's so important is that we are adaptable creatures, you know, and I think that's really important right now as we find ourselves in this pandemic and we're all trying to tap into our resiliency, that we are these adaptable creatures and we're making it work and interesting things are forming from this very unusual time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I love that this work and your work, you know, it's so hopeful. It's yeah. so hopeful Yes. And we talk about trauma a lot and I get a little worried about trauma and this is trauma and that's trauma, you know, and then like kind of framing the, um, the experience, the human experience as such a brutal mm. and uh, <laughs> damaging kind of experience. Yes. yes. That is true that it can, you know, be really difficult, of course, but that there is post-traumatic growth. We can go through difficult things and actually in the overcoming, we find more resilience. Yeah. In the coming back to ourselves and safety, we actually find like more life force and more possibility and more resilience, more capacity. Yes, yes, cool. yes, it is very hopeful. And it's Peter Levine. I wanna think about this. He wrote one of my favorite quotes and I use it in a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. where I share with therapists. But he says, and I'm going to have to think about this for a second. Um, it's, I believe not only that trauma is curable, but that it can be a profound portal for genuine spiritual awakening, mm -hmm. um, leading to just this deep, deep transformation and coming back to ourselves. That's the essence of it. I wish I had the exact quote, but when you look at it that way, it, it's, it reframes trauma, you know? Mm -hmm. If we look at it as this portal to spiritual awakening and genuine transformation, that I feel hopeful about that. Yes, absolutely. That's beautiful. Oh, he's got some really incredible gems. I, um, I, I, I again, I'm, I'm thinking back into my log of like, yeah, what, yeah, where, yeah. Was, where was I reading? Where did I yeah. hear about his own <laughs> journey? I was sort of studying shamanism and indigenous medical practices and. Oh ways of being and that there is sort of and this is a really tricky thing to talk about that i'm not sure how to talk about but it feels really important to name and it feels in profound which is that this kind of work and with the body it it has this way of um entering into a spiritual dimension and it, and i think Quantum physics is the scientific way to really yep. go in and talk about that, that the quantum realm 
has access to our younger selves. So that's some of that inner child work, that early attachment stuff, even renegotiating trauma, mm -hmm. and that it can tap into the collective realm of healing. Yeah. It can even work into our future selves. So we often talk about healing your upline and your downline. And I have lots of clients that are like, we talk about that and then they come back and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, as my nervous system gets more settled, the way that it bumps into these other people in my family line that would have normally, there would, there would be a wobble, right? Yes. Yes. It is wobbly. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Louise Hay, who's one of my favorite authors who wrote the book, You Can Heal Your Life, says that when we do this healing work and we dive into our traumas and heal it, we heal seven generations back and seven generations forward. Firmly believe that. Yes. It's hard to talk about that scientifically. Very hard. <laughs> but, it's, but the science is starting to catch up with it this, is. which has mostly been talked about through the spiritual lens. And for me, that's pretty incredible to have this like one-stop shop that's like well we're gonna feel more capacity we're gonna feel more resilient we're gonna have maybe i mean you can't promise anything it's kind of spiritual it's pretty scientific you know? yeah it's amazing it's true and i love that we now have in the field of psychotherapy and psychology transpersonal therapy mm -hmm. which is where we're bringing in these spiritual components to therapy and i give a presentation on the mind body and spirit in the healing of trauma mm -hmm. because i personally believe that we we need all three of those components and so i do tell my clients i incorporate spirituality into our sessions does that resonate with you during the consult you know because some people that's just, it's not resonant and that's perfectly okay. But I, I do see it as a vital, vital part of this whole body healing. Well, one of the things that is coming up for me, and I've, I've just been thinking about this a lot lately, is um, the impact of trauma. There's, as we've named, there's lots of different variations of trauma or degrees, but one of the ways that it can impact us is a break in trust. There's, I think it's Bessel van der Kolk talks about at the heart, trauma is broken connection, right? Yes. And so maybe we break our connections with ourselves and we start to doubt ourselves. Or maybe it was relational trauma and someone wasn't there when we needed them or someone was there and they ca caused harm. They were part of harm. And so we don't trust others. But there's also a deeper place that trauma can land, which is that I don't feel like the world is a safe place. Yes. Or yes. a benevolent place, or I don't feel connected yeah. to, the, to the greater pieces of humanity or ecological systems. And that's actually kind of culturally in our collective field kind of breaking down right now to not feel connected. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, and especially right now, who feels safe? I mean, we just went through a year where we thought we didn't, couldn't leave our house without the threat of death. I mean, that was our reality. If we left our house, we might catch a disease and die. Um, so who, who feels safe right now? <laughs> it's really going to be interesting for the social scientists to track and see you know, the, the long-term impact of that. But I do think that that makes it all the more important for us to do this work, to mm -hmm. kind of check in and, and notice and learn when are we safe to, to build those relationships and connection because connection is where resilience is. Yes. We are social creatures. We, in our evolutionary biology, right? Like yes. we got this prefrontal cortex and we decided to care for our young. That was like the big leap, right? We're going to yes. actually care yes. for our young. So our whole biology is around, we need to have more of us together and be caretakers. Um, we aren't wired. We aren't, we don't survive on our own. Mm -hmm. We're not spiders mm -hmm. or fish. In the <laughs> we, right. have, we need yeah. each other. Yes. And so yeah, finding, bringing back that connection and, you know, thank God for Zoom, basically okay. technologies during this time to keep that, that thread alive, but also to really um, do the work 
of finding the areas where we are safe and being able to feel that and expand that. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And that's so important because there's been a constant threat of death and then there's been isolation. So, you know, it's, it's multi-tiered in why we are where we are right now. I mean, many of us are really, really in the struggle of this, this whole pandemic aftermath. And it's not even the aftermath. I guess we're still technically a bit in it. I know. So how are you working with your clients during this very unusual time to feel that sense of safety, even in the world, when the world is feeling threatening? Yeah. I mean, that is tricky, right? Because I'm not separate from this. So right. I very much relate to, yeah. You know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, starting small. So where in your life do you feel safe and connected? Yes, really right. landing that in the body, like is right now. If you can just in this present moment identify this moment is safe, mm. it's not something to underestimate because oftentimes we just don't land what that feels like and we can expand upon that feeling as we start to notice that more and more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this field of positive psychology. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to get back to like, how do we, how do we address all of this? But um, basically it's like, well, we, we're always talking about like how to work with something when it's not working, but like how, what is health, right? What, it, how, how, when are we well? Yes. And in that field, they're sort of noticing that we are wired to have a negativity bias. Yes. Default mode network, or default mode network mm -hmm. is that, you know, I'm going back to evolutionary biology a lot because that's how our system is built. That's the science behind it. And it's like, gosh, before you got to watch out for that barrier over here. And like that cave over there has the predators. And it was more important for survival to pay attention to fear. Yes. And we can really see that being exploited in our world today, that there's fear everywhere because it does grab our attention Mm -hmm. And it really, our system pays attention to that. Right. Yes. So we have to kind of acknowledge that that's how we're wired. Mm -hmm. Why and how that has created a safety for us in its own way. But to counteract that, it's not to deny that things are scary and to be like, it's fine. It's fine. Right. Everything's right. great. But when something is actually safe or something is actually positive, we have to do some work to call attention to that because if we do, it actually can do the work of rewiring and landing that in our neurons, creating those pathways of ease of gratitude. That's why gratitude practices are so powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love that you just said that because it's so important. Rick Hansen, discovered the negativity bias and he's written books. And so when my clients come in and they say, I see everything as negative, the glass is always half empty. And I say, oh, great, you're wired that way. You're right on track. There yes. are ways we can work with it though. I mean, that's truly the natural wiring of our brain. So mm -hmm. don't- It's a mechanism. Yeah. Hey, your body's doing what it needs to do to survive. <laughs> your brain is working correctly. <laughs> don't, yes. don't freak out. Yes. And. There are these other things like you're talking about that we can do to anchor in, in safety. Mm -hmm. I love that. And just remembering those moments when we are safe and getting into our bodies about what that felt like in that moment and recalling, recalling that memory. And so much of it is unconscious. So we have to work on what, I mean, I see sometimes I do experiential exercises where we're like, okay. And like, where can you feel in your body? Um, like zones of your vision. Where is it most safe to be? Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will have memories like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's where the car crash came. And I don't like looking in that direction. Right. Okay. So then we get to work with the activation of that until that field of your vision is actually safer to be in. But that's an unconscious thing until we can slow it way down yes. and feel that. Yes. Boundary work is similar. Like, you know, we kind of, so it's a, popular word these days. Thank goodness. It's a good, healthy word to start working with, but where are my boundaries? Right. Mm -hmm. And then starting to work with that 
in relationship to the body and feeling, oh my gosh, can you feel when you're settled and when you're not? Yes. And then being able to start to recognize that in your life and build upon that. Right. What does that feel like when you're more settled? Right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it's been interesting because I feel like the pandemic has really forced us to do a lot of boundary work because we all have different thoughts and beliefs about what feels safe right now. For some people, it's masking. For some people, it's distance. You know, we all have thoughts and beliefs about these different ways that we're personally going to feel safe out in the world. And so we've sort of, I feel like, been forced to look at some boundaries here during this time. That's true. You know, I hadn't really thought about boundary work going through the lens of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I have been thinking about trauma work in general um, and healing and the polarity that we're experiencing yes. and how one of the kind of tenets of this work, one of the ideas is that when there's something in our body that has not been processed, right? Um, there's a great teacher, his name's Thomas Hubel, and he works with collective trauma and he's got this, an, excellent analogy about, um, you know, if something just is too overwhelming to deal with, we kind of fragment it off. And mm -hmm. that is important to name too, just like the negativity bias is our hardwire working mm -hmm. or to name that when we don't process something because something was overwhelming, that's great. That's our body coping and doing what it needs to do. But if we don't actually bring that back in, and metabolize it and integrate it into our being, it's hanging out there as a fragmented part of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, he's like, okay, so how do, how do you keep that? It's like freezing something, right? So like that, and then the freeze response and the dissociation, the, the, that really, really does look like freeze. But he's like, so when something is frozen, who's paying the electric bill? Yes. There's still energy running, right, to keep that part frozen. And then the another other analogy that he uses is it's like an app on our phone, mm. but the rest of us is getting, they're getting the updates, but not that part of us that's frozen. So it's not getting the real time. It's not catching up to where we are and getting those real time updates. Yes. So yeah. one of the things that happens is as we bring these parts of ourselves back in and integrate, there is more energy. There is more life force. There is more creativity there is more curiosity. We are more open to multiple perspectives. There's more um, resilience. It, you know, it, it goes on and on. Absolutely. And we're not so brittle and crispy around the edges, which I think that um, that has been happening over time. And there's there's just more brittleness in our thinking. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. And so it's important to look at that flexibility and that expansion and contraction and, okay, can I have boundaries that can expand and contract based on the actual scenario in the moment instead of having to be so careful that they stay rigid, which generally looks like they come way in, even mm -hmm. if it doesn't serve us. Yes. Yes. So yes. I talk about flexibility and expansion and contraction a lot with clients. Yes, yes, I, I, I love that, and it's so true how we can we can fragment it, and we have that capacity and ability. I mean, that's part of the genius of our mind. You know, we have this going on with normal life piece, and everything that you just explained is so true. I say in my book, actually, we can prolong grief, we can prolong anger, we can prolong all these things, but eventually they're going to knock on the door and we're not going to be able to ignore them anymore. And so part of the way that we can cope is to fragment it off. I did this, you know, my brother died two weeks before the pandemic hit. And so I went into such survival mode with, am I safe? Can I leave my house? My office shut down, the school shut down, all these things, you know, that I wasn't really addressing any of that grief. Then I got COVID and I was forced to be still. And oh my, I have never knew grief could be that powerful. It was like, woo. And that was 
two years after the original event, you know? And so it'll wait, it'll be there. <laughs> it will wait, it will be there. And now I know, I just know it was such a learning experience for me. If I can in small doses, like a little drip of a faucet, kind of be navigating the grief instead of allowing like the waterfall all at once. Yeah. You know, you saying that reminds me of something that I think is really common is that people, if they are aware that they have trauma work to do, they're really afraid of it because it's overwhelming to begin with. And they're like, I can't like, you know, and it's really important to remind people that it's not about exposing it and like processing it all at once, because that's the exact thing that couldn't happen. Yes. So there is a way that we can take a molecule, yes. pull a thread, like right. get the tiniest little dose, integrate that, have more space to then go back and get the next right amount of dosage. Right. That's not going to overwhelm our system. I mean, the, the technical names for that in somatic experiencing are titration and pendulation. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. And, bring, and it brings in that rhythm of the nervous system to expand and contract. And it is in that flexibility of, can I have arousal and can I settle? And can I trust in my system, right? Mm -hmm. To deal with arousal and be able to settle. And we learn that through pendulation, tiny pendulation at first. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. And I think that's what's so important. We don't have to just dive bomb in head first, swimming in the trauma. No. You know, and we can, we can just address it in these small, small moments, which, which I'm learning to do now. I'm like, okay, I was just like pounded in the waterfall. Let's start doing this slowly each week through, through therapy, through EMDR, through these different avenues. It's uh, I had a teacher one time say, it's like, you would never like try to feed yourself and eat your whole entire food count all on Monday so that you wouldn't have to deal with it later. Yes. Like, yes. You don't do it that way. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, that wouldn't make any sense. Right. Like, so we just a little at a time so that we can digest it. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. And I love how you brought up gratitude earlier because there is so much research on gratitude. And then there's also that we live in this whole world of toxic positivity and all of this. And so I don't know if you met or know of Matt Kahn, but he is sort of this spiritual um, person who's written several books. And what he says, I love this. He says, sometimes we're so spun out that we just can't be grateful. I mean, we're just, we're not there. We cannot access that in our body. And he said, then you go to, I wish I could be grateful and start small. I wish I could be grateful for the floor that it holds me and keeps me upright. I wish I could be grateful for my pillow that's soft. I wish I could be grateful. You just start small. And even that practice in itself does start changing the neural pathways, just mm -hmm. wishing grateful helps us get back into that vibration because there is very much like this thought of we should be grateful and it's not that bad. And I mean, we can't always be there. No. And then the, all this other stuff comes in around comparative suffering and then yeah. not actually feeling our own suffering because, well, we're, I'm supposed to be grateful and someone else has it worse. And right, right. You know, it's like, yeah. We get our perfectionism comes in and then, you know, that hijacks our ability to feel our emotions fully. And then we have all of these kind of crazy making strategies, you know, mm -hmm. and there's something about feeling fully and deeply yeah. and in the right pace and holding space for both. I can feel right. really sad. Yes. And feel some, something is working, something in my life. Absolutely. It's just this chair is holding me right now. Yes, 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 yes. Grateful for the soft pillow at night and I'm in deep pain. My friend calls it simultaneous truths. Both are true. Mm -hmm. That is the human experience is that we can hold both of these at the same time. And you know, Brene Brown talks about this a little bit, and I've been thinking about that. Dan Siegel is someone else who talks about the window of tolerance. And as oh, we yes. resilience, we grow our window of tolerance, right? And some of that is like even so things like joy and pleasure are edgy 
places to be for some there they can be overwhelming ah they can be just as overwhelming as something like some people are maybe more comfortable with the, like difficulty they're like done that my whole life i'm actually kind of comfortable there but yes. like joy yes. that's that that just makes me feel like i'm gonna lose it that means yes. it's only there for a fleeting moment and that's really gonna be very hard to deal with because the next thing that i think about is the foreboding joy of like i'm gonna lose it right yes yes <laughs> Yes, it can be so uncomfortable when life has been such a hard struggle with so much pain. It's almost more uncomfortable when you meet those places of joy and happiness. Yes. But so either way, it's either end of that spectrum, being able to be with and just mm -hmm. be with challenge mm -hmm. and, and hold, and I'm grateful or something, or be with joy. Yes. Be with it. Stay with it that 30 seconds longer, as Rick Hansen would say. Just, yeah, just take it in as much as you can. And how either one of those edges really stretches the other one. The more right. you can be with joy, the more you can be with sorrow and vice versa. Right. Even though one edge of that might feel more comfortable, they actually yeah. you know, work each other. Oh, I love that. I love that, Courtney. Yes. Yes. Awesome. So what is one thing, and this is putting you on the spot, and I don't know if you have an answer to this, what is one thing that we can do just to feel a little bit more safe right now, mm -hmm. unusual times? Do you have like one thought or one strategy or one thing that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean... You know, I, there's so many, and then do I have one? I don't know. I, I'm thinking of this technique that kind of calls upon our neurophysiology, mm -hmm. which is orientation. So okay. when we have a threat response, our vision focuses yeah. or we're scanning, right? Right, right. And so, you know, that idea of doing a body scan and just – can I feel my seat or my feet, right? So being able to feel, can you feel your feet on the floor? Can you feel where your body is making contact? Mm -hmm. and, and then kind of do that questioning, like, am I receiving, am I receiving the support mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. And then coming up from there and actually just spending time looking slowly around, especially in the era of Zoom, can we look far away, really, really far away? What do we take in? What's in the mid-ground? What's in the foreground? Spending some time, that can actually um, help us to notice that, oh, in this environment right now, I'm here and I'm safe. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love that. Great. You are such a wealth of wisdom and information. And I just am so grateful to connect with you through this show. I mean, I've always loved connecting with you and you've always been somebody that I really resonate with your work. But just to come on the show and to be able to share all of this. Yes, your work. <laughs> Got it right next to me in case we talked about it. But yeah, I'm so excited to see what you think. I'd love love to hear your thoughts when you do. Oh, yeah. I'll be giving you a call and we'll we'll chat personally in that way. But thank you so much for having me in this format to have this conversation. It was so much fun. Oh, it was so lovely to have you here. And I just your work deeply, deeply is so important and impactful and and resonant and. I'm very grateful that I had this opportunity to spend this time with you. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. All right.